All right. It is uh, now the top of the hour. Uh, we will go ahead and get started today. Thank you to everyone that has joined us. I know we're going to continue to see the numbers climb, but we want to get be respectful of time. Um, though many of you I know have been joining us for our webinars lately. Uh, we're excited to have you here for Uniquely Universal, the first in our unique series uh, in April and May, uh, where we talk about universal de design for meetings and events. As a reminder, everyone will remain on mute throughout the webinar. So while you can't ask questions verbally, uh, you can do so using the Q&A dialog box. So if you look at your Zoom dashboard, you see the Q&A button. You can open that and you can ask a question of Amanda, our presenter today, uh, and use the Q&A for questions about the, the topic, uh, about universal design. Um, other participants can see those questions and upvote them and downvote them depending on interest so we can prioritize them if we get a whole bunch and I will help feed them to Amanda during breaks in her presentation. We'll also be running a couple of polls today. Uh, we have one for planners and one for venues and I switched up the order today to let our planners go first. So planners will come up first and then venues after our demographics and we'll do a session evaluation at the end. And finally if you have other comments about the presentation that you'd like to make or other questions that you have of the group please feel free to do so in the chat box. Hit that chat button if you haven't already, it'll open the window. I just remind everyone to please select all panelists and attendees next to the, the two. There's a drop down there where it says two right above where you type your message. So everybody gets the benefit of those things. And with that, I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Amanda Kraus to lead us today through our session on being uniquely universal. All right, thank you, Joel. Okay, well, thank you um, to Unique Venues for hosting this webinar on Universal Design. I'm really delighted to be here with you all to speak about a topic that um, is important to me both personally and professionally, um, given my experience as a disabled professional um, working in disability resources and in higher education. Um, Universal design really presents a unique set of strategies that we can apply to a variety of venues. Um, so with that, I will get started. Um, coming to you from Tucson, Arizona, as you can see from my background um, at the University of Arizona. And now my slides are not advancing. Oh, there we go. All right. So what is our goal when we talk about universal design and specifically universal design in the context of events and experiences? I always like to say that our goal should be ensuring everyone a similar, if not identical experience, right? So with that in mind, I'd like to kind of frame this conversation this morning or this afternoon, um, by saying that some of this is gonna be philosophical, right? Some of this is going to be a reflection of our values and how we think about our work and how we think about others and community. And some of this presentation is going to be operational. So we will be discussing some practical implications, many of which don't really have um, any sort of increased by, you know, cost or financial impact but it's more about building in some more intentionality into our thinking and our planning. And that will amount in or result in a more positive experience for attendees, but also for the planners, right? As someone who identifies as disabled, I've been in many different situations where it is clear to me that no one thought that someone who used a wheelchair might attend their event. And of course there's a personal impact and a little stress that that causes me, but I can also see the stress and embarrassment and awkwardness it causes the professional who's working the event and representing the organization. So universal design has the potential to really reduce the stress and enhance the experience overall. And so on the slide, you'll see, you know, all attendees for whatever the event or experience is, you know, they're spending the same amount of time and money and resources to, to be there, whether that's a conference or, you know, um, 
a gala, uh, whatever it is, right? All attendees are doing the same things to get there. So why should some attendees or participants have a less than experience, right? And that's the philosophical part that I want us to all kind of think through today and moving forward. So then the second part of this, you know, this prompt or this discussion is, hold on, sorry, the window blocked my, hold on, the little pole blocked my view. So hold on one second. Um, the second part of it, the operational end, is how do we make event planning more easeful and more efficient? So we'll discuss kind of both of these philosophical and operational um, approaches over the next little while. Okay, so I always like to think about access as existing on a spectrum. Um, and I don't know that we have all been trained to appreciate the flexibility that we have in interpreting what access or accessibility means. I think many of us, in particular, those of us who work in disability resources have been trained very much to think about individual accommodations, right? So I have a disability related request and so you will accommodate me, right? To ensure that I can attend, I can participate, right? Going back to my example earlier, being a chair user and knowing how that feels, it might be accessible, but it also might not feel very good, right? It might not feel as convenient or as seamless. Um, so if we look at this spectrum and on the screen, there's kind of the arrows pointing away from each other, representing a spectrum. One end is access and underneath it says individual. So that's the individual approach make a request for an accommodation and we'll accommodate you. The other end of the spectrum says equity, right? And equity is more universal, right? And what I want to encourage is a response to this um, imperative or this opportunity that helps us appreciate there are a lot of ways for us as event planners to promote and even ensure something that is equitable, right? That is good, that is respectful, right? So I think sometimes we get maybe nervous, right? About making the wrong decision or um, engaging with someone in such a way that we kind of mess things up, right? Around accommodations, but there's a lot of ways that we can ensure something that's not just accessible, but something that's equitable. And so, again, something to think on as we have this conversation. So we've been talking about universal design, but I do wanna take a moment to define it and to share the seven tenets of, of universal design. So <clears throat> the definition of universal design is the design of products or environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. And we should note that universal design comes from architecture. It comes from the design industry and discipline. It is not a disability thing, right? Universal design has wide reaching implications for people, for diverse groups, for spaces. Right, and I think, you know, there are, there are ways that we could say disabled people might inordinately benefit from better design choices, but I think you could really say that about anyone, right? Typically, when we put a, a design feature in place that increases access for one person or one group, it increases access for everyone, right? And the quintessential example of this you, if we could put up a poll, I would ask you to guess, but is the curb cut, right? The curb cut on sidewalks. That was, uh, you know, relatively recent development in American history, right? In the last 40 years, I would say. Um, so that's, you know, the, the dip in the sidewalk 
that eliminates the curb or the step up. Now, that is certainly an important choice for chair users and people with other mobility impairments. But it's also where people who are pushing baby carriages, people who are on scooters or skates or you know, walking with children or walking in groups, it tends to be where everyone wants to cross the street. And so again, that is the most quintessential and I think easily accessible example of a universal design choice intended to benefit the disability community that really has great impact on the entire community. So the seven tenets of universal design, equitable use, right? So how can everyone who is experiencing, let's say, your venue, your program, um, your, let's say, award ceremony, whatever it is, how can we really try to ensure that everyone has the same experience of the space of the program, right? And we'll give some examples as we go. But going back to that spectrum, access on one side, equity on the other, we can, sure, we can make sure that everybody has access, but what universal design is promoting is that everybody has the same experience, right? Nobody is disadvantaged when it comes to safety, convenience, time, money, et cetera. The second principle is flexibility in use. Um, are there multiple ways that people can engage with the space, the content, the communication, the information? Or is it just the one way that we've all been kind of socialized or that we all default to, right? And an example of that is, you know, maybe how we present materials for classes or for programs. We can send something electronically and we can provide a print copy. We can also have an app that people can use, right? They choose how they engage with whatever it is we're looking at. Number three is simple and intuitive use. Apple is a really great example of this. Apple makes things pretty simple, right? You, you buy a new iPhone, you turn it on, it's charged and ready to go. Um, I would say that sometimes, um, whether it's higher ed or other kind of venues, we know and we love our product and our space and our community. And sometimes we tend to make things overcomplicated. We're familiar with it, but the people that we're inviting into the space are not. So how do we really think about the easiest way to invite people in to describe how to use something? Is it simple? Is it intuitive? Right, that addresses a number of diverse characteristics. That could be disability, could also be English language learners. It could also be uh, the person who didn't have coffee this morning and is running late to their first session and you know just doesn't have the processing abilities at that moment to figure out the directions that you've laid out in your website or in the app, right? So simple and intuitive perceptible information, that is mainly sensory, I would say. So your signage, your name tags, right? Um, how do we know where to go? Is the signage, are the directions clear and perceptible? Um, thinking about name tags, and we'll talk about this later, a lot of our organizations provide name tags, you know, for lots of good reasons. But they're often so small or so, um, you know, kind of stylized that we can't read them from a distance, right? So perceptible. What do you want people to know? Building on the other, you know, previous uh, tenants, what do you want people to know and how easily can they detect that information? Tolerance for error, right? A quintessential example of tolerance for error you're writing your document on, on Word, right? And you go to X out the window. And what does it say? Are you sure? Do you want to save? Are you sure you don't want to save this? Right? There's tolerance for error built in to most many 
products that we use often. So how can we build in those same safeguards, right? Tolerance for error as you're going in and registering for an event. If I make one incorrect move because I've never done this before, am I locked out of your system? Right, so how do we encourage people to stick with us by supporting them through the process? Low physical effort. This is really relevant to events, conferences, anything where people are going to be negotiating space. Right, less important for us in this Zoom webinar, but in terms of how large a room we're using for a conference, a set of activities, a retreat. Is there a lot of walking back and forth, a lot of pushing across a hotel carpet? Are there doors that are just really heavy for people? What are the ways we can minimize physical effort in our, our planning? And I mean, that's another, it's a little tricky, right? Because, you know, I'm mentioning disability quite a bit given my orientation to this work, but disability is not always visible right and a lot of things are not always visible and we should not expect participants to disclose every unique characteristic about them so we can plan accordingly that's the whole beauty of universal design is that we're going to design for the widest possible audience the most diverse group of people and folks are going to come in with their unique characteristics and backgrounds and we're going to be ready for them the last principle is size and space for approach and use. If you think about a stage and a podium, right, that somebody is going to be addressing the room, a keynote, um, some sort of uh, workshop, is there enough space for that person to access the podium? Can they see over it? Can the audience see them? Thinking about, let's say, um, let's say a job fair or a poster session, right? We've all been parts of, you know, breakout sessions where you take a big conven convention hall and you set up lots of tables with lots of swag and lots of banners and it gets very crowded. Are we allowing appropriate and adequate space, right, between those tables for everyone to navigate? So these are principles, they're tenants. You can look online and find tons of examples and pictures and directions on how to really um, ensure that you've accounted for these seven um, you know, strategies really. And that's what they are, they're strategies. I always say that universal design is a process. You know, we learn from our mistakes, and sometimes, unfortunately, you know, folks are kind of bearing that, right? We're learning at their expense, but we're learning, right? And I can say that as both an event planner and as someone with a disability who has experienced things that weren't great when it comes to events um, or experiences. But it's a process, right? So with our thinking and our planning, we want to make sure to reflect on how things go, how things went, and what we learned, and commit to, you know, kind of a consistent reflection and assessment, and we'll talk about that as well. I often think about humility when it comes to this kind of work, and it's not necessarily in the PowerPoint presentation, but all of this takes humility, right? We have to be open to kind of owning some questions and maybe mistakes that we've made. We have to be open to taking feedback and open to reflecting. And I think if we can approach our work with that, we're striving for something that is universally accessible. Is that maybe a realistic possibility? Maybe not. Universal design is an ideal. It's something we work toward. So if we can appreciate that design is a process and a series of choices, I think that sets us up um, to be more successful in our process. I might stop there for just a quick moment if there are questions or reactions to universal design. So there are no active questions yet, although what I want to say, because I really appreciated that last little bit there about how this is a process, 
Um, and I, we're getting a couple of thumbs up and things like that in the chat, chat box right now. Because I remember a few years ago, and, and I've spent a lot of years in higher ed with a lot of it with you. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I consider myself to be pretty good at thinking through what are some of the um, inclusion options that exist out there. And I was at a conference of maybe five or six years ago in Vegas. It was a big company corporate sponsorship thing. And the keynote, they had the whole works all set up and the big flashy lights and the strobes going on, the audience, all that stuff. And I had a, a, an attendee with me that was, it basically triggered PTSD. So yeah. again, it's one of those things I would have never thought of in a million years. And of course, we all love the flashy, exciting, you know, yeah. wow thing. But we need to ask ourselves, you know, can we do that in a way that's not necessarily going to trigger something for someone? So it's, it's a process. It's not, you can't know everything all at once, or you can never be an expert here. All you can do is continue to learn from your experiences and improve them for the future. Absolutely. And and you can engage with participants who are maybe offering feedback or or even concerns with that spirit of humility, with the spirit of, I, I understand what you're saying and I will do better next time, right? And it's natural to think from our own consciousness, you know, and that's, that's a, a lifelong process as well as, you know, it's not necessarily empathy, but it's kind of thinking about things beyond our own experience and universal design is a really good teacher in that. Okay, so let's, keep, let's mm -hmm. keep rolling. Yeah, move ahead. So when we think about universal design, I like to think about it as a responsibility. So what is our responsibility? And then what's the impact when we do it? Right, so there's a table here. Um, I try my best as a little asterisk. Um, when I'm presenting or teaching, I try to describe everything on the PowerPoint and read everything verbatim as a universal design strategy and as a way to maximize inclusion. Because while I assume everyone on the, on the webinar can read, I don't know how well you can see this, right? And that could be based on my design choices, based on your particular you know, situation. Um, if you imagine in person, right? If we were in a large lecture room or a large conference room and I had a slide up at the front of the room, thousand people in the room you're sitting all the way in the back can you even see the slides so you know this is something it doesn't cost any more money and it doesn't really take more time and when you get used to doing it but it does increase inclusion so our responsibility when it comes to universal design is to begin to identify barriers right and we'll talk about how to do that um, but, but then work to remove those barriers for next time and we want to incorporate access into our design initially, right? So we should really be thinking of, again, that widest possible audience and designing for that diverse group, um, building in access and inclusion features throughout. What does that result in, right? What's the impact of that? It's an inclusive and welcoming environment. I can't underscore that enough. Right, in the work that we all do, we work with people, right? People who want to feel included and welcome. They don't want to feel othered or separated or burdened, right? So when I see good signage and I can use as a chair user the same entrance as everyone else, and there's lots of options for me as, and, uh, as far as where I want to sit in the room, that really makes me feel welcome. Right, that's a very different experience than someone panicking when they see me enter and then giving me kind of an alternate accommodation. So we wanna think about inclusion, we wanna think about truly welcoming experiences. Often when we make a good choice when it comes to our design and we're really practicing universal design, it tends to be sustainable. Meaning that we think about it once, we don't really need to think about it ever again. Right, we, we purchase an accessible piece of software now, we don't have to do that again, right? We, we make a plan for how to set up the furniture in the room and we incorporate access, we incorporate flexibility. We do that once, we've really addressed the whole system and we don't need to do that again. So ultimately it's less work for us in the long run and equitable, respectful experiences for everyone, right? That's what we 
That's what we want to provide. That's what people want to come away with. So a commitment to universal design helps us really operationalize our goals and our values around equity and just basic good, respectful experiences. So another way to kind of think about this, I have a diagram here that it has universal design and accommodation. Right now, regardless of how you come to this work, those of us who do events are used to having to make accommodations, sometimes on the spot, sometimes throughout our planning process. But a universal design approach and you know what this image is trying to imply is that the universal design can encompass the accommodation, right? You can make a good design choice and eliminate the need for any individual accommodation, which is really what we all want, planners and participants. So if you think about a universal design approach, the benefits are that this is proactive work, right? This does help make, make people feel welcome. It's proactive, I'm anticipating difference and diversity and I'm planning for that. Like I said in the previous slide, it's often sustainable. Do it once, now I don't have to think about it again. It's seamless, right? Good design is usually indetectable, right? An accommodation is a big glaring area for wheelchair users to sit or folks who are using interpreters and it's flagged off and it's roped off, right? Not as seamless, it's still accessible, but is it equitable, is it respectful, is it seamless? Le less. Um, we've talked about inclusion and, and making people feel welcome, but you know, the one thing I want to, to, um, to really underscore is that universal design can also be really effective. Right, it can also be rigorous. You know, sometimes, especially those of us who work on college and university campuses, we might get concerns or questions from folks about, are we sure that this universal design choice is really gonna be good for the participants, for the students, for the audience? We're not kind of diluting down the message or taking away from our rigor. No, not if it's done well. Accommodations by contrast are reactive, right, which increases some of the stress and panic that we've been talking about on both, both sides. They're consumable, right? So they're often more expensive and more time consuming. So whereas a universal design choice, you know, could be in place forever and ever, you never have to think about it again, you will have to think about individual accommodations again, every time you plan an event, every time you open up registration, you know, it's meant to accommodate one person. And that means you're gonna to have to keep doing it again and again in your planning. Like we've said, they're separate oftentimes, not seamless, not inclusive. Um, and they're also kind of a burden, right? They can be a burden on our time, on our budgets. And there's also that intangible burden of feeling like you're the participant who made everybody work really hard, who upset someone, who caused a scene. And again, nobody wants that. So as much as we can in our journey and in our process, we want to try to rely less and less on accommodations and build in for higher levels of access and inclusion through a universal design approach to event planning. So if we think about event planning, right, there's kind of the before, during, and after. A lot of UD stuff, universal design stuff, is going to be the planning, it's going to be the before. So the remainder of this uh, workshop is really looking at some concrete suggestions about how we can better plan, better prioritize through each stage of our process. Before I get into concrete examples, how are we doing in terms of questions, comfort, reactions? I think we're, we're doing well, actually. We just had a couple of questions come in that might be good to answer before we come on. I'll let Elizabeth know. I know Amanda's gonna talk a little bit about uh, all access bathrooms, so mm -hmm. she will answer that coming up here. Uh, someone just asked a question about, please define inclusion, if yeah. you would. Yeah, I can do my best. Um, I think inclusion is, a seamless and welcoming experience where 
something that is just, hey, we know we need to accommodate you, right? We know that we need to make sure that you can come and participate. That's compliance, right? That's accessible. Inclusion, I mean, again, these are personal definitions too, but inclusion to me means you really thought about my participation. I'm welcome here as much as anyone else is welcome here. My level of engagement and participation really is not devalued or invalidated, and it's also not harder to achieve, right, than it would be for the next person. So I think that's where we want to really think about accessible is, is certainly the ground floor. It's what we have to do. And, and I'm sure it's what we all want to do. Inclusive is kind of this beautiful art of making the access feel good, seamless, equitable, um, easy, respectful, convenient, right? All of the things that I think if we were to say, how do you want your participants to experience this event? I would venture a guess that we might all say, you know, that whole list that I just, you know, share, right? So I feel like it's offering that and extending that to every single participant and not just the majority. Perfect. And then just one other quick one and then we'll move on. I got a couple others that are holding, but I know you're gonna to get to them in part of your, um, your presentation is, um, there are a lot of planning templates that event planners and venues can use out there. Do you know of a good planning template that incorporates universal design tenants? Yeah, you know, there are a lot of good resources and I haven't really found one, you know, uh, one great best resource. I'll always direct people to the University of Arizona's website. We have right on our front page of disability resources, um, planning inclusive events. There's information, there's a PDF that you could print out that tries to break down with as much detail as we could the planning and you know, the, the actual event and then the assessment afterward. Um, there are a lot of cities you know, that, that offer good planning resources. So you might wanna venture out of the higher ed environment and really look at some of your kind of city or state level um, event planning resources, but it's hard. You know, I think that it's probably best for all of us to do our research and find something and then add to it the real unique aspects that would represent our own organizations and our own communities. Great. And just for everyone's awareness, Amanda did send me that PDF. I will send it out with the slides and the poll evaluations when I get that in everybody's hands probably early next week. So yeah, it'll give thanks. you some place to look at. Let's keep rolling here and we'll have a couple more to come back to you on the next break maybe. So when we're talking about planning, selecting a venue is important. And if you're folks working at a venue, these are kind of things to think about in terms of how to set things up to maximize inclusion. So going back to that first tenant of universal design, equitable use, paths of travel, right? So equitable paths of travel. Everybody uses the same entrance. Everyone can navigate the room with the same level of ease and option. Um, this is really, especially I would say like the entrance of the building, um, that's gonna be most people's first impression first point of contact with the event or with the organization. And so we want to share that, right? We don't want to say, well, most people can go through the front door, but there's going to be some of you are going to have to go around the side because that's where the accessible entrance is. And I'll, I'll give a quick example of I'm on the board of a, a higher ed kind of professional association and planning out, as many of you know, five years in advance for our you know, conference in 2025. You know, it came down to two choices, and one of the choices in venues didn't have an accessible front entrance. It, it was accessible, but it wasn't really good, and you needed a chairlift. And we were like, no. You know, that alone, even though there were other advantages and other, you know, pros to that venue, that first impression for all attendees you know, it didn't fit for us. It didn't reflect our values. So we went somewhere else. Accessible parking, you know, is there ample accessible parking? 
Um, is it close by? Things like this. Um, restrooms. Um, are there enough accessible and all gender restrooms? Um, oftentimes for conferences and bigger events, I've seen organizations negotiate with the venue to take a bank of restrooms, uh, gendered restrooms offline and turn them into all gender. Right, they can advertise that, share information on that, obviously change the signage for the duration of the event. Um, but you wanna think about, okay, I expect this many participants kind of uh, planning for diversity. I need to make sure that we have options that are both accessible and all gender. This is an, an example of where disability and kind of gender issues um, are, are, there's a synergy. Right, because there are often um, needs that disabled people would have for an all gender restroom because their personal care attendant needs to accompany them to the restroom, right? There's lots of ways that accessible and all gender restrooms benefit lots of folks. Elevators. Are there enough elevators, right? Are the elevators centrally located? Um, and I think this is particularly relevant when you have a big event where you're using multiple buildings or multiple ballrooms, right? So we wanna make sure that there are enough elevators, but also that, going to my last bullet point there, that there's clear signage directing people to all of the accessibility features. So nobody needs to ask, right? Nobody needs to find someone from the event, track them down and ask a question. It's just easier for everyone. In terms of sleeping rooms, you know, are there going to be a percentage that are available that are ADA compliant? Um, questions to ask, you know, I kind of structured this slide as, you know, we all want to provide an accessible experience, but sometimes we don't know exactly what kind of questions to ask or what features to put in place to make sure that it's actually accessible. Um, are, how many ADA sleeping rooms are there? Are there options when it comes to one bedroom or one bed per room? versus two? Um, are there options in a roll-in shower or a shower seat? Are there uh, rooms, and there are going to be, but you wanna make sure they're available for your block, that are um, accessible for deaf and hard of hearing folks, meaning that they have strobe lights that will alert them to emergencies like a fire alarm or a doorbell or a phone. Right. And then if you think about how long are people going to be here at this event, what's going on around the community, how's the surrounding area, are the restaurants accessible, are, the, the side, are there sidewalks, right? I mean, these are just things that I think are worth looking into. I think as much as you can take pictures and maybe if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I, I have this question about accessibility, I'm wondering about sidewalks, I'm wondering about sleeping rooms you have good information for them, maybe even photos, right? And then all of that, you know, clear signage, whether it's already there from the venue, or if you as a planner need to beef that up a little bit and add signage so that people have less questions. Again, simple and intuitive. Communication and information. So thinking about as early as your first website, you know, coming soon, right? Event registration is gonna be open next week, next month. Um, any sort of marketing that you do to promote your event. You know, I always like to say we should be over communicating access and, you know, kind of inclusion features because I, the reality is I think there are a lot of diverse groups, diverse populations that have just been kind of either overlooked historically or excluded historically from events like these. So whatever that is, you know, if that's my next bullet here is infusing disability and diversity content and images. So you want to include information on accessibility features on all of your marketing, but you can also kind of have an image that's representative of a diverse group of people. Um, it might sound cheesy, but it goes a long way for folks who aren't sure if this event or this organization is for them. Um, thinking about accessible emails, accessible PDFs, just because something is electronic does not mean it's accessible. 
more and more it's harder to mess this up, but it is worth checking to make sure that you are creating and um, publicizing you know, your event with accessible documents. One quick check for this is if you're looking at a PDF document, if you cannot select the character, right, if you cannot highlight a letter in a word, it's not accessible. And what I mean by accessible is accessible to screen reading devices. So a uh, software that reads aloud written, printed, or, you know, electronic communication to folks who are blind or low vision. Sufficient contrast in all of your marketing and all of your PowerPoint slides and your, you know, content for your keynotes and your workshops and activities. You know, I, I feel like simple is better. You know, there's a lot of, I think, design choices, right, that go into all of what we do. But, you know, pink on red for a Valentine's Day event. Um, you know, having something that's like a, like my background right now, right, a beautiful landscape. But if I put print in front of it, it's gonna get lost. So sometimes I think it's really like less is more, sufficient contrast so people can see things clearly. Committing to inclusive language. Um, uh, you know, I think that could be as simple as folks rather than guys, um, right? Like we're, we're all kind of becoming accustomed to. Um, I think it could also be avoiding jargon, avoiding um, acronyms, at least initially, as you're kind of orienting people to the experience. When it comes to disability, what I would offer is you know, you don't need to talk about anything quote unquote special, right? I don't like special as it comes to thinking about special populations or special accommodations because that doesn't make me feel included, right? It makes me feel othered. Um, specifically with disability, you've probably noticed that I've tended to use disabled, so identity first language. Um, I'm a, you know, disabled person versus person with a disability. I'll just say for the sake of this conversation, either way, um, you know, if you're saying person with a disability or disabled folks, I will say that is way better than special or any other euphemism that we might be accustomed to when it comes to describing the disability community. These are personal choices, so I think the best that we can do as organizations and as professionals is offer something that's just simple and respectful. All right. I offer here two different accessibility statements that you might consider copying verbatim or um, you know, tailoring to meet your style and your kind of um, priorities. But you know, that first bullet on the previous slide was just include information on access and invite people to request accommodations or to request information about accessibility throughout, right? And I think you can do that very simply, to request disability-related accommodations or with questions about access, please contact, you know, and give the name and contact information, someone from your event. By contrast, right, I'm not saying for special requests, right, or for special accommodations or any other word for disability, but I'm just saying disability-related requests, right? And if there is a barrier, you will have time to figure it out beforehand. But given that we're all committing to universal design, your answer to that person might be, there is no barrier, right? There, there is no need to accommodate in this instance because the access is built in. The second example is a little bit more, I don't know, uh, flowery, but like at ABC organization, we value access and inclusion and want to ensure your full participation. So to discuss barriers or to discuss your questions, please contact. You know, that's not a call out to disability necessarily, right? That could be, I have a severe airborne allergy. I have a gluten intolerance. I wanna know about all gender restrooms, right? I'm coming with a service animal. Um, I, I'm a parent and my children are gonna be with me. 
what flexibility is going to be built into the content of this event. So really that sets you up in a more, I think, again, welcome and inclusive way to indicate that you are thinking about diversity and that you're open to really any question or conversation. How are we doing so far? I have a I few think, more slides on practical. Yeah, I think we're doing good. Um, just really quick so I can close a couple out. There was a couple people that also asked about coming back to all access bathrooms. Uh, you know, some, some attendees take offense to those. It's difficult to balance those needs out. You know, how do you, how do you actually describe to uh, an attendee um, the need for all access restrooms and how do you sign those things appropriately to make sure that people understand what they're used for? Yeah. I think the signage question is easier, <laughs> right? The signage question, I mean, there's good templates available. I, I always like to say all gender versus gender neutral because I think there are a lot of reasons that the word gender and the experience of gender is not neutral. So all gender and then, you know, the accessibility sign, which is that international symbol of the, the chair user kind of pushing themselves now. Both of those, the language and the symbol will indicate to the people, um, to your participants, what the bathroom is. You can describe it on your website. You can describe your rationale in your program or on your app. Um, you're absolutely right. There are gonna pe be people who take offense, who are uncomfortable. Um, you know, I always like to kind of think about, there are a diversity of attendees here. And we strive to make sure everyone feels welcome. Um, commentary, going to the bathroom shouldn't be a political experience. Um, as a chair user, I can tell you it often is. So what can we do to minimize any of the additional stress around it? I think we can frame it as a larger diversity and inclusion issue. And I did give you an example of why the disability community, I would say needs access to all gender accessible restrooms. Not that I don't think we should be talking about gender, right? And folks who aren't going to choose, can't choose. But I think you can couch it as part of a larger commitment to, uh, to inclusion. Um, any other questions before we move forward? Uh, no, I've got one still, but we'll, we'll say, let's keep going through the presentation. Okay, so during your event, Thinking about physical space, we've talked about common entrances, exits, and paths of travel. I'm imagining a big, you know, uh, ballroom, right, that's set for either a reception, a dinner, um, you know, uh, a big keynote event. So as a planner and as someone working at a venue, what are the multiple ways that we can set this room, right? And that doesn't have to be a ballroom. I'm thinking kind of worst case scenario in my head. That could be a small conference room on a university campus. When we set it auditorium style, when we set it conference style, when we set it breakout style, how do we train our teams to set things with access in mind so that there isn't a barrier or there's no panic when we all enter the room? So is everyone able to enter and exit by the same door? Can people have the same paths of travel? Um, I'm gonna skip down a couple bullets to distributed seating. That's again, really easy to do. Auditorium style, make sure that there's some seats pulled out for folks using chairs, for folks who might have service animals, for folks who might have a, you know, a larger body size. Right, but it shouldn't be relegating those folks to either the very front row or the very back row. We always want to try to be giving people choice. You know, everyone should have a choice in where they sit. Venues like auditorium venues are challenging, but what can we do to make them a little bit more inclusive? Um, accessible parking, accessible transportation, if you're shuttling people to and from airports or local, um, you know, uh, experiences. Um, that's something that you could ask in a registration form, um, or it's something that you can just say, we're renting five buses and one of them has a, a wheelchair lift. Uh, again, elevators and restroom we've talked about. Signage for the access features. I like to 
you know, kind of have a multi-pronged approach here. I like to describe those access features on the registration, in the conference brochure or booklet, but then also, if necessary, amp up the signage that the venue has already provided so that it eliminates questions. Um, name tags, we talked about that earlier. Um, you know, more and more organizations are defaulting to when you register, you're putting in a preferred name, preferred pronouns, and that's displayed on the name tag. I think that's a really good gesture in terms of inclusion. Um, but also going back to, if we can't see the name tag, then why are we spending the resources to provide them? So really kind of minimizing the logos and amping up the name, right? So people can read that from a farther distance. With respect to any materials, you know, it's, I know that many of us still do print. It's probably less common than it used to be. Um, having options in terms of, I'm gonna provide a printed conference program if you want it, but there's also this electronic version and this app. You know, giving people the flexibility again to do what they need to do to engage with your materials in an effective way. So I might be someone who wants to, you know, look at something on my phone so I can blow it up big so I can read it. I might take your electronic materials and, and adjust the contrast or adjust the size of the font so I don't need to ask you to make an accommodation for me. I would say that if you do produce print materials, that you should have a couple of large print copies on hand. And that's usually like a 18 point font, you know, something that's just a bit larger than what we're used to, um, just in case someone needs that. Okay, your program. So like what's going on at this event, right? What activities are we doing? Um, I think for a lot of reasons, we tend to do icebreakers and team builders, and that could be at a retreat. It could be as part of a big event to get to know the people at your table. Um, you know, I, I'm a student affairs person. I'm extroverted. I get that these things are useful and can be really fun. They can also be really uncomfortable when someone either cannot participate in a physical type of activity or team builder or just doesn't want to right like we often talk about challenge by choice i would argue that this is not a choice right i cannot do the human not right so what are what is the purpose of this icebreaker or team builder activity and what are ways that you can do something that's effective without excluding people now this one, I cannot give great examples because it's really going to be relevant or relative to your group and your goals. But the more you know about your group or the more kind of flexibility you build into these types of activities, the more inclusive they can be. Um, captioning. So if you're using something that's pre-produced, you're going to show a TED talk or a YouTube clip or we made this great promotional video really get that caption beforehand before you build it into your PowerPoint or build it into your presentation. Captioning is, the cost for captioning are getting, it's just getting cheaper and cheaper because I think people are, are appreciating how beneficial it is. Um, waiting until the last minute or, you know, going without captioning, you really run the risk of excluding um, a, a group of folks who couldn't access the material otherwise. In terms of flexibility, are there breaks built into your schedule? Um, can you start early some days and later others? Um, how can people engage? Going back to um, the activities or the ways that you're encouraging gathering, are there some flexible options there? Interpreting and CART computer-assisted real-time captioning. I would offer to you that interpreting is an individual accommodation. It is not a universal design feature because if you don't use ASL and you've paid for two interpreters for three days, it's a lot of money and no one benefits. It increases access for no one. 
right? So a lot of people think like, I want to be inclusive. So I'm going to arrange to have ASL interpreters there. Only if someone requests it, meaning that I speak ASL, I communicate with ASL, this is going to make things more accessible for me. It's not a universal design choice. Does that make sense? So CART, on the other hand, is a more universally designed approach to making, um, to making content accessible. That's the, the stenographer, right? That's kind of like the live captioner who is real-time captioning everything that is being said by the keynote or by, um, you know, by the speaker. And that provides more options for people, right? So if I'm deaf or hard of hearing, I can likely read those captions and be included, right? If I'm an English language learner, oftentimes it's much more helpful for me to read along as I'm hearing you speak. Um, you know, the, the captions tend to linger, right, on the screen. So if I look down at my phone or someone says something to me and I miss a point, I look up and it's still up there. So that's what I would offer to you in terms of communication access with respect to your actual program. Food is another area of, you know, really needing to think through inclusion, a variety of dietary options. And if there's a buffet, let's say, which is often a cheaper option, are there staff available to assist, you know, with either serving? It's always nice in a buffet if, if someone serves everyone. So that eliminates some of the weird dynamics that might pop up if someone can't serve themselves or reach over the hot, you know, display, you know, there's, it's a little safer. But I will say this, if you're having staff offer assistance, they should offer assistance to everyone, not just the people they think need help, right? It's just safer, more consistent, more respectful. And then the follow-up to that is if someone refuses, the staff need to respectfully accept that response. And this is something that happens all the time, very well-intentioned, um, but I also think it's an opportunity for training. If someone comes up to me and says, can I help you with that at a buffet? I could say, sure, thanks, that would be great. I could also say, I'm good. And the second someone says, are you sure? Personally, I, I get a little frustrated, right? Because it's like, hey, I'm a professional. I'm here with everyone else. You need to develop some really good, consistent behaviors when it comes to assistance. I think I, I'm gonna, okay, sorry. More communication and info. We talked about some of this, but I'm thinking kind of day of what is different here? Um, the only thing that's added on, we've talked about accessibility language and inviting people to request accommodations. We've talked about providing materials electronically and in print, and if they're printed, having some large print copies. We've talked about captioning. I did mention to you that I describe images and read everything on my slides. A lot of times, organizations will give speakers or presenters some tips, you know, how to maximize inclusion in your teaching, in your presentations, and that might be a really good one to think about. Um, the only other thing on this slide that I haven't covered is use the mic, right? We often get into situations where we have a lapel mic for the speaker, or we might have a handheld mic that someone is circulating around the room to field questions. And often people say, I, you can hear me, right? I'm, I project, right? Joel does project very well. Um, so, so do I, right? And I still need to, again, going back to that humility piece and thinking about outside of my own experience, the mic is available, use it. Um, it does increase access for deaf and hard of hearing participants. And as a leader, as the keynote, as the speaker, as the person welcoming your participants to the event, you can set the tone for that, right? If someone says, I have a really loud voice, can you hear me? Yep, 
I can repeat your question out, right? So everybody hears it. Or just hang on one sec. Someone's going to bring you a mic. That's all. No big deal. And it, and it helps increase inclusion. Coming down to the last couple slides, in terms of the after, before, during, and after, what's your assessment process? Are you including questions on accessibility and inclusion in your evaluation? Right, so were you able to request accommodations, et cetera, et cetera? Did you feel that you could fully participate? Right, and that could be um, based on disability. It could also be like, I couldn't use the bathroom because there weren't all gender bathrooms and I just couldn't stand it anymore and I left, right? So questions about how you can improve that experience for next time. You can also track the number of requests for accommodations you get, that one instance and over time, right? As we've, cause that, that's kind of the goal, right? Is to reduce the need for the individual accommodations. So the more we practice universal design, the fewer requests we've had for accommodations and the assessments show people could fully participate, right? So what are the trends and how do you use that information? We had 50 people ask about parking. So how do I, what do I do with that information next time? Is it feedback for the venue? Is it, we need to include better signage, right? I mean, whatever it is, it's going to be closer to that universal experience that we're hoping for. And you know, are there disabled folks involved with the planning? If there's not, if you don't have, you know, colleagues or, you know, constituents that you can talk to, then maybe it is really relying on your evaluation and getting feedback um, from diverse folks. Red flags really quick, because I know we're running low on time or over time. If anybody has to do anything separate, special, if there's an additional something or other, another request, someone has to do something extra or different. That should signal to us that there is a barrier, right? And that's our cue to do something differently next time. So if our goal is similar, if not identical experience for all, then really there shouldn't be any of those, those things, right? Nobody should have to do anything extra or special. Everyone should be having the same experience. So rather than become defensive or worried, use that as information to do something different next time. The last parting thought, and I'm happy to take some questions. I know we're just about over time, but just a reminder that just because something is accessible does not mean it is equitable. And that really harkens back to the question that someone asked earlier about how I define inclusion, how we define inclusion. It's this, right? Just because you've made an accommodation or just because you don't wanna get sued and you've put some things in place to ensure an accessible experience, that is not the same as an equitable experience. That's what we're trying to promote for participants. That's what participants deserve, right? And so I'll leave you with, my contact information, but open it at this point if there are any lingering questions or reactions. There's, uh, there is, and, and thank you, Amanda, for, for presenting today. We're getting a lot of great feedback, and uh, definitely the, the evaluation results are showing that. Um, I have one open question that I wanted to ask of you. It came in from a venue uh, okay. that asked, as a facility, what resource can I look to to see the criteria of what truly qualifies as an accessible facility is there one official resource, resource that has specific criteria and guidelines? I don't think so. I mean, I can offer you some, some resources. Like, so the, the Americans with Disabilities Act guidelines, the ADAGs are getting better and better with every revision, meaning that they're giving you more detailed information and they incorporate more of that equity spirit as, com as opposed to when they were designed initially 30 years ago, very much compliance oriented so that's a resource um you know there are going to be universally there's going to be universal design features or resources rather that you can look up also the access board i mean i'm going very governmental here but the access board is basically like a hotline and you can call and ask them questions about design choices and you know 
the, the built or the information environments, they should be able to, to give some perspective or some context and they give pretty good guidance. Um, you know, the ADAGs are gonna be your, your bottom floor, right? This is what I have to do. But then it's great jumping off point, but then it's you really thinking about, this is how I've seen people engage with my space. These are the accommodations that I tend to make um, on site. Um, these are the questions we tend to get. And it might be even like a work group, a universal design work group that's taking one of those tenants a year, right? And looking at equi equitable use. It could be trying to get <clears throat> focus groups from users and get their feedback on really what universal design means. You know, UD, there's a range of ways to make it work where the ADAGs are gonna be very concrete, you know, discrete suggestions. So that's kind of what I can offer. Great, and one last, just if you have a quick thought here, you know, maybe a minute, minute, minute and a half. Um, how does all this apply to what's going on in the world right now with COVID-19 mm -hmm. and social distancing? Do we have to think about that? Do we have to think about universal design at all in relation to how we respond as we start things back up? That's such a good question. I mean, day one of our, you know, critical incident response team meetings at U of A, of course, I'm the compliance officer and in this large group, I raise my hand and I'm like, this is a case study in universal design, right? Everything we're all doing right now, this webinar, Right, I mean, we're incorporating UD considerations and features to everything we're doing. We're allowing people to work from home who never would have been allowed to do that before. We're moving classes online that faculty never wanted to offer in that, in that format before. Um, we're really thinking about flexibility and we're really thinking about innovation. Um, every organization, every institution of higher education, I feel like is pretty much in the same boat. As much as we want to be inclusive and flexible, we haven't had to do it at this scale. So we're all struggling a little bit, but what's guiding our conversation and our thinking is we have to innovate right now, we have to be flexible, and we also have to remain effective. And those are really important kind of characteristics of UD. So we're all living it right now, I've been recommending to colleagues, you know, we should be taking notes. What, what's really working well? What don't we want to go back to? How can we maintain this level of flexibility moving forward? So, I mean, I know it's a pandemic and it's devastating in many ways. There are some lessons we can learn and take with us moving forward. That's great. Well, again, Amanda, I really want to thank you for being with us today. This was great information. Great, uh, thank you. Lots of good feedback. I have a couple of follow-ups for you as well that we'll connect with offline. Sure. And um, I just want to remind everyone that's still here, again, thanks for sticking with us. We have a whole bunch more webinars coming up, a couple more in our unique series uh, next week, Generation Z, uh, with Dr. Corey C. Miller, and then uh, one with Dr. Brown coming up on May 13th around leadership. Uh, we've also got some more in our next level series for digital advertising and uh, marketing strategies. And uh, finally, you can see the other dates up there for member group therapy and our upcoming planner roundtables and orientations. So uh, you can find all of these online at www.uniquevenues.com resources. Head on out there, register for everything. Everything is free right now. Feel free to share with anyone that you know in the industry, family and friends, anyone at all that wants to participate. We'd like to include them during this time. So. With that, I'll give everyone just another 30 seconds. If you haven't done the session evaluation, go ahead and fill that out before you go. And uh, we appreciate, oh, I got all 106, 106. That's fantastic. So thank you to everyone that was here today. Uh, we appreciate your time and we'll see you on a future UV webinar. Thanks and have a wonderful afternoon. Hey. Okay.